House of the Dragon Season 1 is focused on the Targaryen succession crisis. In Part 2, we'll see how Rhaenyra continues challenging norms, all the while navigating her complex political situation. Let's get this started. We meet Rhaenyra 10 years after Part 1, and her situation evolved quite a lot. We see her during labor, and it seems incredibly painful. If I were Rhaenyra, I would be terrified to give birth. After all, her own mother died in labor. This scene also serves as a contrast to her younger self. In episode 1, Emma told Rhaenyra how women serve the realm by having babies. And Rhaenyra replied, I'd rather serve as a knight. So the labor scene also shows how Rhaenyra is not as free as some people like to think. She, just like everyone else, is bound by her royal duties. Officially, Rhaenyra has three children from her marriage to Laenor Valerion, Jaceris, Luke, and Joffrey, who all bear the Valerion name. But Laenor is gay, and Rhaenyra's children look like Harwin Strong. In other words, they're bastards. In this world, bloodline is important because it is used as a political tool to strengthen alliances between powerful houses. Throughout the second half of the season, many will use this as a way to discredit her claim to the throne. For instance, Alicent and the Greens will try to exploit this situation to their advantage. After seeing the baby, the Queen suggests Joffrey is also a bastard. She tells Lenor, Do keep trying, Sir Lenor. Sooner or later, you may get one who looks like you. Lenor and Rhaenyra tried to have children but they were not able to, and she must have children to secure her line of succession. So what other choice did she have? She did the only thing she could. Even if she had no choice, the legitimacy of her children remain a big political liability for her. More on that later. By the way, we're so close to 2,000 subscribers, so hit that button and join the fun. If Rhaenyra wants to sit on the Iron Throne, she must circumvent an array of political obstacles with regard to the line of succession. We just discussed how the legitimacy of her children is a problem. Her stepbrother Aegon is another problem as he poses a direct challenge to her claim. We covered this in previous videos. Marrying Alicent could lead to a succession crisis if she gets pregnant with a boy. The king should know this but somehow he moves ahead anyway. And eventually, Alicent gives birth to a boy named Aegon. So the king now has a son. This creates a direct challenge to Rhaenyra's claim. When the king dies, the realm will be faced with two claims to the throne. Rhaenyra is the heir to the throne, but her political position remains weak. So, at the small council, she suggests a reasonable course of action. She proposes a marriage between Jaceris and Alicent's daughter, Helena. This could avoid war between the Blacks and the Greens. Under normal circumstances, powerful houses would jump at the opportunity to marry their daughter to the future king. But Alicent refuses, and it only makes Rhaenyra's claim look even weaker. Rhaenyra decides to leave for Dragonstone, the historical seat of House Targaryen, and soon after her departure, Harwin Strong dies under suspicious circumstances. Alicent knows that Odo returning would help foster an optimal political environment for Aegon to ascend the throne. But Odo cannot be hanged as long as Larys's father Lionel has the job. By the end of this episode, Laris will murder his own father and brother. And now that the hand of the king is dead, it is possible for Odo to make a comeback. Rhaenyra's departure may have been motivated by her difficult political position at court, but it will be the most consequential mistake she'll make. Here's why. First, people at court already questioned the validity of her claim and have been for years. Her absence will make it easier for gossip to spread around. Second, leaving King's Landing will isolate her from power. 
In her absence, she will not be exposed to the day-to-day -day decision making of the small council, so she will lose institutional knowledge. She also won't be able to develop critical alliances with powerful houses and power brokers at court, and she'll ultimately be blindsided by the green scheme to usurp her throne. Finally, leaving for Dragonstone is not good PR. If people question her legitimacy, it's because of her half-brother Aegon. And while Rhaenyra is on Dragonstone, Aegon remains in King's Landing. It sends a clear message to those at court and the people they govern. The scope of her mistake is evident in the last episode of the season, when she's faced with a fait accompli. Rhaenyra will be on Dragonstone when she will learn that her father died and that the Greens already crowned Aegon. Distance will blindside her. I will dedicate a whole video to the last two episodes focused on Rhaenyra and Alicent's rivalry, so make sure to subscribe for that, it's coming very very soon. Although Rhaenyra is on Dragonstone, she remains a central player in the Game of Thrones, and episode 7 illustrates that well. The royal family gathers on Driftmark for the funeral of Lena Valerion, who was married to Daemon. They had two children together. Jace tells Rhaenyra he wishes to mourn Harwin's death, his biological father. This scene shows that the children are more aware of their surroundings than their parents think. In other words, Jace knows he's a bastard. Rhaenyra is seen looking around to make sure nobody heard him. She shuts him down quickly and tells him they must hide the truth to preserve their power. So when Rhaenyra accuses Alicent of hiding under a cloak of righteousness, it could be argued that she is doing the same. Just like Alicent, Rhaenyra also puts pressure on her children to keep them safe, but also to preserve her own power. On that front, Rhaenyra and Alicent are not so different. But most of the time, Rhaenyra treats her children with respect and takes time to explain political situations. Rhaenyra does not infantilize her children. Perhaps she wants to avoid repeating her father's mistake. So Rhaenyra's approach to parenting is more human. In part one, we saw how Rhaenyra was groomed by her uncle Daemon. His plot to marry Rhaenyra will stretch over the course of multiple time jumps until he succeeds. Episode 4 highlights Daemon's predatory behavior towards Rhaenyra, who's still a teenager. For instance, we see him flirt with Rhaenyra and offer her wine. He says, You've matured yourself. Daemon wants to groom Rhaenyra for his own political gain. The events of Episode 4 is one instance of the grooming process. Their relationship takes a drastic turn in Episode 7, but the context surrounding it is unique. Daemon and Rhaenyra were both married to Valerions and therefore have Valerion children, although Rhaenyra's children are bastards. Lena is dead, and Rhaenyra says Lenor is useless. So Rhaenyra and Daemon reconnecting could jeopardize their alliance with the Valerions, and nobody would dare to make an enemy of the Valerion fleet. But for now, they let desire guide them, and they sleep together. I know we have Daemon stands on this channel, I often run polls on my community tab asking you what videos I should do next, and Daemon is inching closer every time. Unbeknownst to Rhaenyra and Daemon, another event of significant importance is happening at the same time. Now that Lena is dead, her gigantic dragon Vagar is without a rider, and Alicent's son Aemond does not have a dragon yet, so he sees this as an opportunity to claim Vagar for himself, and he succeeds. Upon his return to the castle, Aemon is met by Jace, Luke, Bela, and Reyna, and the children fight. It's clear that the divide between the Greens and the Blacks is now multi-generational. Aemon calls Rhaenyra's children bastards and threatens them with a rock. Luke takes a knife out and slashes Aemon's left eye. We heavily covered this scene in our Alicent analysis, but this time, let's put ourselves in Rhaenyra's shoes. Everyone meets in the Great Hall, and they are all pointing fingers. 
Allison's child lost an eye, and Rhaenyra's children say it's because he called them bastards. Chaos ensues, and the king tries to understand what happened. Allison says it's unacceptable that Rhaenyra's children brought a knife to the fight in the first place. She's right, her child lost an eye, and Rhaenyra can clearly see Allison's rage. On the one hand, Rhaenyra wants to protect her children from the queen's rage. The legitimacy of Rhaenyra's children has been an ongoing problem for her. So Rhaenyra sees this event as an opportunity to weaponize her weakness against Alicent. She says, this is the highest of treasons. Prince Amond must be sharply questioned. This is a bold move because everyone knows her children are bastards. Alicent knows, the Valerians know, even the children know. But this is the ultimate loyalty test for her father. Will he side with his daughter Rhaenyra or with his mutilated son Amond? Now keep in mind, treason often ends with death in this world. So Alicent replies, over an insult? My son has lost an eye, she says. The king asks Amond, who spoke these lies to you? He says, it was Aegon. With tensions rising, Viserys confronts Aegon who tells it as it is. We know. Everyone knows. Just look at them. But Viserys does nothing to solve the issue. And once again, Viserys fails to reinforce Rhaenyra's claim to the throne. Desperate for justice, Alison turns to Sir Criston Cole and says, Bring me the eye of Lucerys Valerion. But he refuses. So Alison takes Viserys' knife and lunges toward Rhaenyra, who never loses her cool. Otto implores Alicent to drop the knife, and she ends up slashing Rhaenyra's arm. Although Viserys did not give Rhaenyra the outcome she wanted, this public meltdown will benefit the Blacks in some ways. First, the court witnessed Alicent's true character for the first time. Second, it is a wake-up call for Rhaenyra and her allies. A few hours prior to this event, Rhaenyra told Daemon she did not believe Alicent was capable of murder. After that night, they will surely rethink their strategy, especially now that the Greens secured Vagar. Rhaenyra and Lenor talk in private. Lenor is remorseful and wishes he was not gay. He says, I hate the gods for making me as they did. And in this scene, you can feel the weight of his sexuality in the face of his royal duties. But Rhaenyra reassures him. As a woman, she understands how sexuality can be a burden at court. Later, Rhaenyra tells Daemon they should get married. This alliance could be beneficial to help overcome the Greens' attempt to usurp her throne. But they must be careful, or else the Valerions could turn against them. Rhaenyra is still married to Laenor, after all. So they elaborate a complex plan in three steps. Step 1. Coerce Laenor's boyfriend, Carl, to stage a fake fight with Laenor. Step 2. Murder this guy, dress him in Laenor's clothes, and burn his body as though Carl killed Laenor. Step 3. Secretly send Laenor into exile. And voila! Problem solved. So Rhaenyra and Daemon get married in front of their children in a traditional ceremony. Although Daemon brings strength to the Blacks, for instance, he knows how to wage war and hatch dragons, he's also a liability. First, there are reasons to doubt Daemon's sincerity. In part 1, we saw how he groomed Rhaenyra when she was just a teenager. Second, Daemon is violent and will eventually direct his violence toward Rhaenyra. Third, we know that Daemon once held the belief that he is the rightful heir to the throne. And finally, many at court despise Daemon and hope he'll never get anywhere close to the throne. This could be a problem for Rhaenyra as she will need as much support as possible to claim her throne. Despite all the drama, Rhaenyra returns to Dragonstone where she remains isolated from court politics. And it's a huge mistake. 
The Greens are increasingly bold in their attempt to usurp power, and the king is visibly ill. The heir to the throne should not distance herself from the seat of power at this time, and her isolation will have dire consequences for her side, and the next episode shows this well. Six years have passed since Lena's funeral, and this episode mainly focuses on the succession of Driftmark. In short, Corlys Valerion is at war in the Stepstones, in his absence, Rhaenys rules as regent, but Corlys's succession comes into question when people start doubting he'll ever return. Corlys wanted Lucerys Valerion, Rhaenyra's son, to inherit his throne, but Corlys's brother, Vaemond, thinks he should inherit because Lucerys is Harwin's bastard, not Laenor's legitimate child, and Rhaenys wants Bela, Daemon and Lena's daughter to inherit Driftmark. The Greens side with Vaemon in the hopes to flip Valerion's support to their side. The Blacks obviously side with Corlys and Lucerys, and Rhaenys stands on her own for now, but she controls Driftmark. When the Blacks learn of this brewing conflict, they travel to King's Landing to defend their power. It shows how distance prevents Rhaenyra from getting ahead of political conflict and puts her on the defensive, which weakens her ability to make deals. Upon her arrival at the Red Keep, Rhaenyra receives an underwhelming welcome. Then, she witnesses how Targaryen symbols were replaced with religious ones. All of this should serve as a red flag. Alicent is seen wearing ostentatious religious signs. Yes, the Greens are believers, but their increased alignment with the Church was likely a strategy to legitimize their imminent move for the throne. In fact, Odo confirms this in the last episode. He tells Rhaenyra that Aegon was anointed by a septum of the faith before the eyes of thousands. Every symbol of legitimacy belongs to him. Rhaenyra and Daemon are completely gagged that the power structure changed since their departure years ago. But they should not be surprised. The king is very ill. So naturally, the Greens govern in his place. What do they expect? This shows one of Rhaenyra's most important flaws. She often takes her own power for granted and fails to recognize the true nature of power. Yes, power can be inherited, but power can also be accumulated through governance, personal relationships, favors, and trust, all of which require physical proximity to the seat of power. In her absence, those sitting on the small council shape policies, dispense favors to their political allies, and reshape institutional power, all of which undermine Rhaenyra's legitimacy as a power broker. Rhaenyra and Daemon pay a visit to King Viserys. That's when they realize how sick he has become, and they suspect that the Greens are poisoning him. The show is never clear on this matter, but we know that Viserys's health has been declining for many years, way before he was left alone with the Greens. Nonetheless, Rhaenyra and Daemon confront Alicent. Tensions remain high. Rhaenyra implies that Alicent now rules in her father's name, and Alicent replies, I do not rule, as you know well. Rhaenyra meets Rhaenys outside, and it's clear that Rhaenys is holding a grudge against Rhaenyra. Perhaps she suspects her of killing Laenor. Here again, Rhaenyra finds herself in a defensive position. She says, I did not order his death before suggesting they should make a deal to counter the Greens' plan to give Driftmark to Vaemond. This scene mirrors a previous scene. Rhaenyra suggests another marriage, this time between Lucerys and Rhaena. That way, they both get what they want. Lucerys and Rhaena could rule Driftmark together. In addition, she suggests that Gisaris, the future king of Westeros, marry Bela. That way, Rhaenys' granddaughters and Daemon's daughters would become two of the most powerful women in the realm. It would also be ideal to strengthen the alliance between the Blacks and the Valerions. Like Alicent before, 
Rhaenys also rejects Rhaenyra's offer. And that's not good news. In the past, the Valerians married their children to the Targaryens, but Rhaenyra's position is too weak. Rhaenys fears the Greens will take Rhaenyra down. So Rhaenyra is incapable of making deals of her own. And she turns to her only source of power, her father. She pleads with Viserys to defend her power, and he will eventually do. And with the king now involved, Rhaenys publicly accepts Rhaenyra's marriage offers. And it's a wrap on Vaemond. This whole ordeal should scare the blacks to their core. If Rhaenyra is incapable of defending her own power without her father, how is she expected to impose her legitimacy upon his death? But most shockingly, none of the events of that episode compel Rhaenyra to stay in King's Landing to prepare for her succession. The king is terminally ill. The Greens are obviously scheming to take power. They even govern in the king's name. And Rhaenyra's political position is so weak that she can't even make marriage arrangements for the future king without her father's intervention. It should be a wake-up call, especially as the clash with Alicent is inevitable. Please let me know what you think in the comments below, and I will see you next time. Bye.